um, with, with certain shoes, something's going to hurt all the time for a month or so. So just keep that in mind when you're dealing with these patients. Um, there are various toe strap devices. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Um, but let's talk about surgical management. So yes, you have to assess the whole forefoot, <clears throat> almost invariably to some degree of hallux valgus. Um, any surgical treatment of a hammer toe, you have to have enough room for the uh, other toes to fit between the big toe and the third toe, for instance, if you're talking about second toe. So if, you're, if your big toe is crowding the lesser toes, you're going to have a real high rate of failure. So you got to get the big toe straight. We're not going to go into bunions tonight, but just keep that in mind. Um, with patients who are less symptomatic, especially old folks, I'll frequently just do an aching to get the big toe out of the way to, if their real problems are symptomatic, a hammer toe. Um, now, if you have a patient where you think they have adequate room, you're going to leave that toe in a little bit of valgus. I think if you don't do a fusion, if you do an arthroplasty, which uh, obviously the K-wire is a very simple thing to do, it's quicker but you're gonna have a really high rate of fusion of uh, failure because the toe is gonna to tend to, uh, to kind of mold out into valgus. Um, <clears throat> my problem, I did all PIP arthroplasties my first 10 years in practice, which is <laughs> up until 20 years ago. And I started to, to gradually drift towards uh, fusions because while they're easy, it's real common to either get, you correct the flexion deformity, exchange that for a valgus deformity, or they can even recur a little bit um, so they're usually relatively pain-free, but patients will hate that valgus deformity, and you won't get that with a fusion. Um, I think that's one of the most common things patients are unhappy. It's, it's hard to figure out what patients are least happy with sometimes, but certainly a failed PIP arthroplasty is just something that's just a nightmare in these. Um, so I almost never do a second toe PIP arthroplasty anymore in a woman anyhow. Man, it's okay. They get a little residual deformity. They don't care so much. I think the other thing is you can do an arthroplasty, probably keep your K-wire in a bit longer and even roughen up the mid-phalanx to get kind of a pseudo fusion. Um, and this is just a patient is just was miserably complaining. They have residual hallux bias, didn't care at all about that. What they cared about was the big toe pushing against the second toe. And this patient not only had the cosmetic valgus of the, sec the second toe, but they also had some irritation because this since the arthroplasty was unstable, they even had a little callus here. So again, it can be a big source of problem. Now, again, when you're talking about a hammer toe, I'm going to focus on the PIP joint, but the NP joint deformity also needs to be addressed. Um, sometimes that can be the most difficult aspect of the deformity, um, almost invariably an extension deformity. If it's flexible, oftentimes that'll correct itself when you fuse the PIP joint. But if you've got a sagittal plane, a transverse plane deformity, if it's varus or, or valgus, um, you're going to have to use something. Now, one of the things I like about the straight hammer tube is that I will just run the, the guide pin across the MP joint to help hold the toe in alignment during that initial post-operative period. Um, if you're going to do that, make sure you put your hammer tube in before you start mucking around doing a while or plantar plate or anything like that, because you will be stressing your while. If you're, if you're pushing real hard to get a hammer tube to go in or even smacking it with a mallet, you will absolutely disrupt your wild fixation. So be careful about that. Um, there is both a straight and a 10 degree angled implant for the uh, hammer tubes. Um, I don't have a good answer on that. Uh, I like the straight one because I can keep the pin in for a little while to augment my initial fixation. However, sometimes they complain that they don't get quite the grip and especially women doing yoga or people doing other barefoot activities, they will sometimes complain about that. So it might be better to use a 10 degree angled implant in that case, but then you can't put the K-wire across the, uh, the MP joint. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna focus a lot on the, the technique because if any of you are gonna try this, there are some, um, some pearls. Uh, there are minor things that if they don't quote quite right, they'll frustrate you until you learn how to do it. And unfortunately, some of these got blurry. I actually have my rep take these pictures and they're blurry pictures. <laughs> But anyhow, as your typical appearance, as the patient get a second and third um, uh, PIP fusion, uh, longitudinal incision. And you can see uh, first order of business uh, once you uh, make your incision is I just resect a big piece, a tran an elliptical piece of the extensor mechanism so that I can see it easier. Once you've taken that out, you're looking right at your um, condyles on the, uh, the joint. So you're looking right at it. You can take a knife, 
<clears throat> go ahead and release your collateral ligaments. So you have that, the, um, the proximal phalanx sticking uh, out of the wound. Now, <clears throat> what I do then is you want to look at the length of your second toe versus your big toe because you can adjust toe lengths through your fusion site. So if you have a really long second toe, which is not unusual at all, I might take five or six millimeters of bone off the end of the proximal phalanx to shorten, intentionally shorten that toe. If it's not um, excessively long, then you just take just enough bone to get a flat cancel surface. Um, what I'll typically do is I like to just take a small rondure, like you see here, I bite end on, I set the depth of my resection by how deep I bite with a small rondure. And then we turn your rondure sideways, you make two cuts like that and that, and with three cuts, three passes of your rondure, you'll have a flat cancel surface perpendicular long axis of your toe. So it's actually a pretty easy way of doing it. And since the proximal phalanx is sticking out facing you, it's a very easy way to flat cancel surface. Not so with the mid phalanx, which is why they have a really nice system here. Now at that point in time, flat cancel surface, drop your guide pin down and drill it to the second laser line. Um, I almost invariably use a smaller implant. Um, surprisingly, even the second toe, except maybe a men, which of course you're not doing hammer toes on very often, there's often a pretty tight intramedullary fit. Um, but if you can pass that um, drill down to the second laser line, then you should be able to get the implant in. You're never gonna have a problem getting your implant in the mid phalanx, it's cancel's bone up there, but you will have an intramedullary fit on the proximal phalanx. So now when you uh, finish the proximal phalanx, then you run your guide pin center, center, uh, out the mid, uh, the, for the mid phalanx out the tip of the toe. Uh, this is where it's actually a very cool system. This reamer here uh, allows you to make a very uh, well vascularized cancel surface uh, with, without any trouble. It's nice and flat. The only other way of doing this, which I've done with some other systems, is you have to tangentially bite it with a rondure, which is really hard to get a flat surface. Then you're going to go ahead and drill over that K-wire down to the first laser line on the mid phalanx, and then you choose between your 10 or your, your zero or 10 degree angled uh, hammer tube. And again, I almost invariably use that straight one because I like to leave that guide pin in both for initial fixation to augment this, just in case you got a little old lady with kind of softer bone, uh, it might toggle a little bit in the mid phalanx, but by leaving the, the pin in just till the sutures come out, you know, two weeks or so after surgery, I knock on wood, haven't had one fail yet. Um, so here it is in the inserter, you're ready to place it. When you stick the implant down the um, proximal phalanx, you're just basically gonna hole and you push it in. Now, it's important, oh, first of all, you, you withdraw that guide pin so you just barely see the tip of it. You know, if you even have a millimeter or two sticking out, sometimes that could be enough to make it hard to feed the implant over the, the guide pin because you will be putting the guide pin in the mid phalanx, uh, the, the implant down the guide pin. So but you only can loosen up the, the ligaments here on the PIP joint so much. So here you can see pushing it in. It's not unusual at all that you get the thing most of the way down. You want that peak to be a worst case scenario flush or even part way down into the proximal phalanx. It's not unusual at all for it to bind up. And when it does, just hold the proximal phalanx in line with your metatarsal, i.e. a metatarsal you've not already done a while on because you will absolutely destroy your wild fixation if you're banging on it with a, with a punch and a mallet. But make sure if this if proximal phalanx is in line with the, the, with the metatarsal, then just put a tamp on. You can just gently tap this thing down till you know, about half or a third of that peak is gone. Then at that point in time, um, you can see here, I've got it till the peak was just flush. And it's a little bit of a stretch, but you, unfortunately it's a blur, I apologize. But you pull that proximal phalanx over and you'll see the tip of your guide pin just start to go down the hole that implant and then you impact it and like I said I like to leave I just pretty much typically always leave the pin in just even if it's a some of the real hard bone I just would rather have the pin in there to serve it just in, in case they jam their toe you know if they're being non-compliant they kick something inadvertently that pin will keep it from displacing it probably wouldn't displace anyhow but it's it's a very simple thing the pin doesn't hurt at all when it comes out in clinic so I just recommend doing that. <clears throat> now, one thing that's important, so these are 0.045 uh, K-wire caps you put on them. And again, I leave these in all of them, but uh, and of course, always check your, your vascularity afterwards. But 
It's important when you do this before you close, once you feed this implant in, even before I bother driving your, your pin down, make sure when you're looking at your fusion site here, you don't want to just see the bone up against bone, but you want to see your grip blast equally distributed. On occasion, if for whatever reason that you don't have a decent uh, intramedullary fit on the proximal phalanx, you will push as you're feeding the proximal phalanx over the tip of the implant, it'll push it in. You know, shoot your, your fluoro shot and you'll see your grip blast here and down here. If that happens, it's not a big deal. What you do is you just then take the toe, have you know, your assistance retract for you, distract it, and you'll be able to see the, the, the implant because you can always get the, the bones apart three, four millimeters. Then just grab it with like a mosquito hemostat and you can push the, the implant up so you get the grip blast into the mid phalanx. They pop it back down again, you repeat your fluoro shot and then you'll see it like this. But that does happen occasionally. You wanna make sure uh, that you check that fluoro shot before you leave the room. Because if you got the, needless to say, if you have the top of your implant down here, it's not gonna do you a damn bit of good. So do make sure that you take a quick fluoro shot. You see the grip blast on both sides of the fusion site. Oh, I <laughs> didn't change this slide, changed the last slide. I've certainly put in over a hundred of these by now and knock on wood, I haven't had a failure yet. Um, I've used four other systems and had about a 10% failure rate. There was a peak only implant I used that basically the darn thing was flexible and I had three out of five fail. Um, running the M pin across the MP joint, when I first started doing, I only did it when I wanted to keep the MP in a certain position. Now I just stick it, I stick the pin down to the base of the proximal phalanx and all of them. And then again, if I have a little residual flexion for me, if I have a little residual varus or valgus, then I'll go ahead and run the pin across the MP joint um, for anywhere from two to four weeks. Um, so here's just a couple quick examples. Um, <clears throat> here you can see the, the big toes clearly crowding the second toe. So did a bunion correction as you see here, you got your hammer tube implant here. Um, and probably the peak is a tad on the low side, but this healed up fine, the patient's stable, and they were very uh, happy with this. But again, you've got to get the big toe out of the way. Um, otherwise, um, you know, it's, it's gonna fail. Now, the other thing is there's a tiny bit of residual valgus. I probably didn't do quite a big enough ache in here. So if this toe was even bumping a little bit in an arthroplasty here, that would almost invariably have uh, molded into valgus eventually. And again, here is an intraoperative fluoro shot in a patient where I did cross the MP joint. The patient started off and they had a little bit of varus going into the surgery. So again, the grip blast is through. I've done that first. Then I start doing my ligament releases down here, run the pin across the joint of the toe, neutral varus valgus. Um, <clears throat> now, why not just do a PIP arthroplasty? It takes about five minutes. You don't have to fart around with this, and I'm sure the CPT code's the same. Well, it's just because things can go wrong. So here's, here's a lady that had a, a bunion surgery previously. Now she has a hammer toe. This is actually a different um, implant, but I, I used a fair number of these, and this was not that unusual. The thing would cut out through the top of the uh, mid phalanx, and now it's just a huge problem because I haven't had a... a um, well, the hammer tooths fail yet, but if I want to get it out, I can actually cut right through it through the peak part. Whereas this thing, the only thing to get it out is to destroy the bone around it. You cannot uncouple devices like this once they're in, or if it's a solid device like a bunch more, you can't obviously disassemble them because it's a solid piece of metal. Here's another patient that pre-op pallet rigus, had a PIP arthroplasty and a fusion done. And then eventually the thing, uh, the, the Fusion was probably in a tad too much valgus and the toe molded. Patient's happy as a clam with their fusion, but the, the PIP joint's rubbing on the great toe, so this had to be re revised with the fusion. Now the patient's completely happy. Um, the other problem with some of these other implants that are solid like this is, this is actually an intraoperative fluoro shot. The only reason why I show this is I put these in years ago, and then I realized I didn't like the way the MP joints were lining up. I'd already done my wiles, so I wanted to augment this with pins, forcing the toes out in a little bit of excess valgus for the first few weeks. And then you're running your pins kind of in the soft tissue line there because you can't get them down the bone when you have a solid implant like this. So uh, in conclusion, hammer toes, yep, they're a minor, quote unquote, minor problem, but they can have a really high rate of dissatisfaction with surgery. Um, I always offer non-operative treatment like silicone sleeves, toe straps, et cetera. Um, that way, 
for those young folks in the crowd, if you treat the patient without surgery, they come back asking for surgery, they'll never feel like you're knife happy with them. Um, I found that arthroplasties, there's a high rate of cosmetic dissatisfaction, you know, whether it be molding into valgus or some recurrence of flexion. So that's the reason why I've pretty much gone away from arthroplasties, at least in women, at least to the second and third toes. Fourth and fifth toes, it's not that unusual. You can't fit uh, an implant down there. The canals just get too small. And then, you, you know, you're going to have to do an arthroplasty or, or a, whole length, a full toe length screw. Fusion obviously prevents, prevents against recurrence, but warn the patients preoperatively the toe won't bend. And you'll be surprised that even when you tell them it won't bend pre-op, they're gonna complain about a post-op. Um, and I, like I said, I've actually put in more than hundred of these now. I don't know exactly how many, I suspect uh, <laughs> some at corporate could figure it out, but knock on wood, I haven't had a single one of them fail. And in the unlikely event, it does need to be revised or removed. You can literally just take a bone cutter and cut right through the, um, the old fusion site, and it'll, it, you can just cut right through that peak. So it makes it very easy to take it out. Whereas the solid implants I showed you, the only way to get them out is take a saw and cut lengthwise or a burr and burr or saw through the bone lengthwise in the toe till the, the implant finally shows itself. And by then you've removed almost half the bone of the toe. So you have to be very, very careful with that. And that is a whirlwind tour through fixed hammer toes. Thank you, Dr. Thordeson. I looked it up while you were speaking. It's cl you're closer to 200, and you were one of the first surgeons to put one of these in. So, um, kudos to you. It's uh, thanks. Thanks for that presentation. It's been a little while since we've done a hammer tube talk, so there were some things that I picked up right away there that I hadn't thought about in a long time. So, thank you for sharing that, um, folks. That have questions. Uh, there was there was one that came through that just said, uh, "Let's see. This is this is from uh, Charles Huber. It says Dr. Thordeson." He was asking about the percentages of, of straight versus angled right. and two seven five versus three five. And I think you hit on that, but maybe just one more yeah, time. So just, can... Yeah, just briefly. I use the straight pretty much in everybody. I just warned them beforehand uh, that their toe is going to be straight. And the reason for that is um, I just really like to have the ability to leave the pin in for the first two weeks, just in the event that the purchase in the mid phalanx is a little bit on the soft side. It's not going anywhere with the pin in there. And again, I, I've, when I take the pin out two weeks, I've never had one get loose afterwards. Um, I pretty much always use the small one too, um, because again, it gets, it, that canal gets really tight, really quick in the proximal failing. So probably in a man, you could probably use the bigger one. But again, since I put the pin in there to back it up for the first two weeks and I haven't had one fail, I'd rather have it easier to put the implant in. Awesome. Uh, let's see, we will go ahead and shift gears a little bit here. So we, we're, we're going from you know, rigid toes to more of your flexible contractures. Although Dr. Caesar, you've used Tenotac in a variety of applications and excited for you to, sh to share, um, share some of the, the weight bearing CT images that you have and just discuss some of the cases. And so um, for everybody on the call, it's not familiar. Dr. Caesar actually uh, published a case series with us on Tenotac um, version 1.0. He's used um, 1.0. We just launched 2.0. So we asked him to come on this evening and talk about his experience there. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Dr. Caesar. Thanks. No, oh, thanks for having me. Um, I have to follow Dr. Tardison. Well, I'll do my best here. Um, so these are complex. So thanks, Gene, for, for the invitation. That was a pleasure. Um, I think there's going to be some overlaps. So I'll go quick through the overlaps here, uh, Jim. Uh, but I like to say that when we're talking about uh, lesser toe deformities, uh, it's we have more questions than answers. Uh, Dr. Tordeson mentioned how, how difficult it is and uh, uh, tiny problem, big big issue for you to, to achieve uh, most of the time what patients are expecting. It's very prevalent. Um, I'm not here to teach anatomy for you guys. You know how the anatomy here is very complex. And I like to say to the residents and fellows, it's kind of like there's so many uh, tendons pulling the strings there uh, that is like a, the toe is literally a puppet uh, and depending on, on, on what is uh, uh, pulling more you're going to have the contractures uh, usually for the DIP and the PIP uh, the flexion uh, will win the battle but for the MTP usually the uh, uh, the, the, the battle is uh, won by uh, extension so it's more common to have extension of the MTP and flexion of the PIP and DIP um, it usually uh, happens gradually, uh, although it could happen acutely. 
like a plantar plate uh, acute rupture. Uh, I'll, I'll leave that more to uh, Talusan, that is the expert of the plantar plate here. Um, but these patients are very tough. Uh, the majority of the times, uh, if the, the more the deformity is mild, the more challenging the patients are because the expectations are very tough. And, uh, and, and I, I think that there's the, that's the reason why a lot of surgeons just choose not to treat this kind of deformities because uh, uh, the, the reliability of predictability of good results is not, it's not easy. So I always tell my patients that you're, usually you're, you can give them better alignment uh, but they're going to get stiffer. So you, you have, in, uh, and Dr. Torres can explain uh, what he talks to his patients, but it's something that I, I, I always emphasize and highlight to patients, that the toe will always be uh, a little bit stiffer. And I tell them that the, the, the lesser toes are the adolescents of the foot and ankle, uh, that they should, the patient should expect the unexpected because the, your, the tendons are still going to be pulling the strings and there's no room for perfection. You can make it better, you cannot make it perfect. Uh, and uh, Dr. Tardis also mentioned some of these. I'll go quickly. So the things that I usually look into are associated deformities. Uh, Alex Valga's bunionette deformities are really uh, common in, in a combination with lesser toe deformities, instability of the first ray, uh, metatarsalgia, uh, and, and breaks in the metatarsal formula. Uh, we talked about, Dr. Tardis was talking about rigid. We're focusing more uh, on the flexible here. Uh, hind foot alignment, uh, I use weight burn CT, so I check the foot and ankle set, but you can do clinical assessment. You can uh, look into uh, Saltzman hind foot view, uh, as well as gastric nemias or uh, Achilles tendon contractures with overload of the forefoot. So those are just some of them. And the options for surgical treatment are so uh, are, are many, right? So you can do, uh, depending on what you have, if you have metatarsalgia and long metatarsos, you can do the traditional wild osteotomies. You can do more uh, diaphyseal uh, uh, osteotomies, uh, you can do flexor to extensor tendon transfer, you can do tendon lengthening, either dorsal, uh, the extensor tendons or the flexor tendons, you can do plantar plate repairs that, that Talusa will be talking about, you can do uh, the osteotomies uh, minimally invasive with a distal metatarsal, um, a minimally invasive osteotomy or DM DMMOs, uh, and in very severe cases with complicated rheumatoid type cases, uh, you can do the, the traditional Clayton Hoffman procedure. So many, many options. And the complication that we're trying to avoid uh, are floating toes, vascular issues to the toes, uh, uh, and stiffness that I told. Uh, my experience is that patients don't like stiffness of the toes, even if you give them a more aligned toe. There's several algorithms, and unfortunately, there's no time to cover all the algorithms for treatment of this. Um, but I was looking for options uh, uh, from the traditional treatment with plantar plate repair, while osteotomies, flexor to extensor tendon transfer, and PIP joint fusions uh, that I still use uh, when, when they need it. But I was looking for something else to avoid, uh, particularly uh, uh, among the complications, uh, particularly the stiffness of the MTP joint that I think when you do traditional while the autumn and flexor to extensor tendon transfer, I think the stiffness is uh, very, very prevalent, and I, I think patients hate it. Uh, so that's that's that has been my my treatment uh, for um, uh, uh, flexible deformities. Uh, when there when there is a, a component of central metatarsalgia, I do distal uh, metatarsal osteotomy, minimally invasive, or the DMMOs. And the Tinatec, and uh, this is the Tinatec 1.0, this picture here, and I'll explain the, the, the differences. So this was the Tinatec 1.0 where you had a, uh, a male tack that goes plantarly and a female sleeve that would go on the dorsal part. Uh, uh, we will run through the technique and I'll explain the differences. I say that that was the iPhone 1. That uh, was the, the iPhone number one. Uh, the good thing of uh, the, the Tinatec, it comes with uh, like a stereo, Pack, package that has everything that you need. This is still for the for the uh, iPhone one for the first version of the Tina Tech, and you can see here how uh, it comes uh, packed and sterile. And this is the Tina Tech 2.0. And we're going to talk about the differences. Uh, and this is the iPhone 13, probably right, um, because we I think we we were able to make it much better and much easier to be inserted. Um, and we're going to talk about the features that made it easier. Uh, so if you see here. Now the TAC, the plantar ta uh, uh, TAC has um, a toggle, can toggle and can tilt to accommodate to the plantar surface of the proximal phalanx. 
So before it was very important for you to put the pin in a very specific situation, a K wire. Uh, you, you wanted to be perpendicular to the plantar aspect of the plantar of the proximal phalanx. Now you don't have to be uh, uh, that, picky, that uh, uh, picky anymore because uh, the tack will accommodate and will grab the, the, the tendon uh, in a perpendicular way with the, uh, or uh, sorry, in a tangent way with the plantar aspect of the phalanx. Um, it's also wider, so it, it has a, a, a better bite into the, the, all the, the sleeps of the flexor tendons. Uh, and the dorsal sleeve is now uh, lower profile, uh, and, uh, and, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, ideally, this should be in line with the ridge, the dorsal ridge of the proximal phalanx dorsally. We're, and now we just have two sizes. Two sizes. Uh, uh, when you measure, it's either a short or a long. And before we had three sizes. And is I, I say this is really a joker for you to treat uh, uh, lesser toe deformities. Uh, we're going to focus on like the traditional hammer toe here, but you can literally treat any of the uh, lesser toe deformities with this system. Here it's me trying to explain in an easy way. There's nothing easy here, but uh, when you have like a traditional hammer toe deformity, like I said, the MTP is an extension that most of the times the proximal uh, uh, BIP joint is in flexion and you have a loose plantar plate. Uh, probably Toulousan will curse me forever because the plantar plate is not properly drawn here and it's not really connected to the metatarsal. So we'll see what, how much it will curse me. But what you want to do when you're doing this, so I, I, as for me, the Tinotech has been my, my superman, but you want to bring the phalanx, the proximal phalanx down. So you want to plantar flex or flex the, the MTP and you want to extend the PIP and the DIP. Um, and when you do that, uh, when you extend the DIP and the PIP, because of the insertion of the, uh, the, the brevis and the longus, you're actually putting tension into the tendons. Uh, and we're, as we're gonna see in the technique, uh, you can put a K-wire to hold that uh, for you while you're putting your Tinotec in. Uh, that will keep the FDV and the FDL in tension. You're gonna see why it's important to get the tension. And then you can manipulate your MTP put your MTP in the position that you want, usually is uh, plantar flexion. Uh, and then the tenotech will change the insertion of the flexor tendon. So it's a, I say it's a flexor tenodesis or a, a, a change in the insertion of the flexor tendons. So the flexor tendon, instead of being acting to flex the PIP and the DIP, the flexor tendons will be pulling the proximal phalanx down and keeping it in a, a reduced plantar flex position or neutral position that would be ideal. So what, that's what you want at the end of your procedure. You want the distal part of the tendon, distal to the tenotec to be loose, uh, allowing the DIP and the PIP to extend. Remember they were in, in, in flexion contracture and you want the tendons to be tension, under tension proximally to the tenotec, pulling the proximal phalanx down. This is what you want, a tight string proximally and a loose string distally. Here is a technique, uh, I, this cadaver was two with the Tinotech one, but I, want, I will highlight the differences. So uh, the easiest way, this is a cadaveric specimen, but you usually use a K wire to find your entry point. So you wanna be uh, on the metaphysio diaphysio region of the proximal phalanx. Um, once you find that, you can shoot your, you do a small approach. You make sure that you don't have the extensor longus, uh, the return longus tendon uh, in your, uh, the position of your wire. You do just a small approach to check that. You can shoot your wire in. Uh, you see that when I shoot this in the cadaver, it was too proximal, right? If you're going to drill that, would be too close to the joint. I always leave my first wire there because it serves as a guide for the second. So that's kind of a technical tip. Leave your wire, and then you can shoot another wire using your first wire as a guide. So for the Tinotech uh, first version, uh, you wanted this wire to be perpendicular here to the, to the plantar surface. Like I said, now it's not that important anymore to be uh, that perpendicular. So you're going to see my second wire. I shoot my second wire. I like the position. Now you can see how perpendicular it was to the plantar aspect of the phalanx. Um, now you don't have to be that picky anymore. You can, you can allow some uh, 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 malposition in the plantar aspect uh, because the, the tilt of the, uh, the, the plantar tack will accommodate to that. And then you use that, you, you put the wire through the skin once you like the position, and that's gonna be the mark for you to do your plantar approach. Uh, I, I like to say it's not a minimally invasive procedure in the beginning. This anatomy, we don't go that frequently plantarly in the, in the forefoot. So it's a deep dissection. There's a lot of fat there and you wanna be able to see. So when you start doing this, 
uh, don't be that economic with the approach. Do it enough that you can see. And then you see the wire there and uh, you can kind of see the tendon. You want the wire to be uh, in between the sleeves of the, uh, of the flexor tendon. So you want to divide half of the tendons one side, half of the tendons to the other side for both. If you're, you could get just the FDL, that you can get just the FDB, or you can get both. I most of the time get both of the tendons. And then that's what you want. You can retract your, your, your wire dorsally and make sure that it's going in between the two sleeves of the tendon. And then there is a, again, this is all for the Chinotech uh, first version, the 1.0, uh, but you have a manual drilling uh, that you're gonna uh, go plantarly under direct visualization of the tendons. There's a countersink in there that you can uh, do as well. Before, for the, for the first version of Chinotech one, you had uh, to drill the dorsal part as well, just to remove a little bit of the bone. Uh, right now for the 2.0, we don't need to do that anymore. And I will show you why. And then there's an inserter. You're gonna go through the, 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 the hole that you drilled uh, manually. Uh, you're gonna insert uh, with a, a male or the planter tech inserter. Uh, you wanna make sure, and now remember that I told you, see how the 1.0 was kind of thin? There's still tendon kind of going out of the, of the tech here. Now the tech is wider, so it's gonna get more of the tendon. Uh, and you see that I'm using my hand. I have my index finger on the dorsal aspect of the phalanx of the proximal phalanx so I can plant or flex it when I'm, uh, uh, when I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, attach the, the, the dorsal component. Before we had three sizes, like I said, now we have just two sizes. And now you can see uh, my, my finger trying to correct uh, the deformity there, putting the, the, the dorsal tack. Um, you want, to, you want your, your, your hand from the dorsal and the plantar side to be in line, so the, the inserter plantarly uh, with the dorsal inserter, uh, uh, you want it to be in a single line. Uh, this is what I talked about, that we can put a wire through the PIP and the DIP to keep them in extension and keep your tendons under tension. Uh, I, I left this to the end, but you could do right uh, uh, before um, uh, you, you inserted the, the, the male part of the implant or the plantar part of the implant. Uh, and once you, you inserted that, you plantar flex. I'm not, I don't have the picture of the plantar flexion here, but this is uh, the final situation there with the implant. Again, this was the 1.0. So the changes of the 2.0, uh, like I said, now uh, the inserted of the male or the, the plantar tack as this uh, metallic sleeve that will push the bone. So if, it, if there's any residual bone of the drilling, that will push the bone out of the failing. So you don't have to necessarily drill from the top down anymore. Uh, one of a uh, of, uh, of, uh, 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 technical tip that is very, very useful, and I have been doing this for all my cases, is to put a suture on the flexor tendons, distal to the, in, uh, to the uh, point where you're uh, inserting your tin attack because you, with that suture, you can traction, put traction in the tendon distally to make it even tighter uh, while you add your, your, your dorsal component and you lock the, uh, uh, the tendon into the new insertion point. So putting this, the, this suture can allow you to uh, provide uh, axial uh, tension to the tendon before you really uh, uh, lock the, the, the tin attack uh, and grab the tendon. Like I said, there's just two sizes now, so it makes your life much easier. You, had a, you have a large or a small. Um, so if you're in between these two lines, it's a large. If you're here, it's a small. And you can see now how it looks, uh, this tilt uh, of the uh, male or the, the plantar tack as you can accommodate to the plantar surface of the, uh, of the proximal phalanx. And like I said, now it's a much uh, less prominent dorsal aspect of the implant and, and ideally this uh, needs to be in line uh, with the uh, longitudinal axis of the phalanx uh, in line with the dorsal crest that uh, we have in the proximal phalanx. Uh, these are some images from uh, Cadaver Lab uh, with the uh, Chinotech 2.0 showing that positioning. Maybe a little bit too proximal here in my opinion. I would like to be a little bit more distal but you can see how it, it's wider in, in, in that scenario, it grabs much more tendon um, than it will, the, the first version would grab. Um, I had some cases here. Jen, do you want to make a, like a stop before I do the case or should I go to the case straight right away? Uh, let's just go right into the cases, Dr. Caesar. I think that's great. Good. Uh, so I'll show some cases again. I don't have a case with uh, enough follow-up uh, for the Chinotech 2.0. So I'll show you my cases with the, with the first version. I could show this case here. 
so uh, this case uh, the, with, with terrible deformity and an Alex Vaughn was in a bunionette. Uh, I could show these one, it's also terrible. Uh, we have a crossover deformity, but those are easy because the expectations of these patients is much smaller than this patient here, where the only deformity is the deformity of the second toe. So these are the most difficult in my opinion. Isolated deformities of one specific toe. You can see, and this patient had pain on the dorsal aspect of the PIP joint. Uh, she didn't like the way uh, the, the, the toe was also crossing a little bit with the third. Uh, she had a, a, a relatively unstable first rate, even though her alignment uh, was um, normal. And she did have central metatarsalgia of the second and third metatarsals. Here are some weight bearing CT images. You can see the, 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 the lesser toe deformity, the second toe deformity. I have some x-rays here showing the, the, the long second and third metatarsals. Uh, you can't really appreciate what is going on in the second uh, MTP here. Uh, when you look clinically, you think it's not that bad. Maybe you can look here and see that you can't really see the MTP joint. That, that would be an indirect sign of a subluxation of the joint. But when you see the weight bearing CT images, you will, you will find that that joint was uh, almost completely dislocated. You can see the second MTP now is going to appear right there. So you see dislocated second MTP, pretty bad deformity if you consider the toe. These are thick cuts of the weight bearing CT showing the dislocated second toe. Uh, and the long metatarsal as well as kind of plantarly positioned second and third in relation to the other metatarsal. Uh, she had some minor arthritis of the midfoot that she didn't have any pain. Uh, there's some 3D images here, so I'm going to run through that. I, like I said, I always check the foot and ankle set. She had a normal alignment, was close to neutral, almost a, a mild varus. Uh, and I ended up deciding to do a cotton osteotomy uh, because she was unstable and I wanted to kind of provide more uh, um, uh, function for her, her first rate to decrease the overload of the second and third metatarsals. I did a distal metatarsal uh, shortening osteotomy, minimally invasive of the second, third, and fourth. I did the flexor tenodesis and I also did a gastric recession. These, like I said, this was the, uh, the, the first version, so I didn't like my position here. I repositioned my wire. Now I'm more perpendicular to the phalanx. This was the final uh, view of the intraoperative fluoroscopy showing the, the metatarsals uh, short, and you can see a better uh, metatarsal formula now in the tenotech there. My cotton, of, unfortunately, ended up being an intraticular cotton that you don't want an intraticular cotton. Uh, it's very important to do proper dressings. Uh, so I always do this kind of sandwich like the, uh, the dressing at the end of the procedure to keep the second toe down. But I have some images here pre op, post op x ray with three months. Um, here are some weight bearing CT images of three months showing the, the improvement in the correction. And I'm gonna go quick here because I always have a lot of images just showing the 3D images of the TIN attack. Uh, Pre-op, post-op, uh, three months, you can see the distal metatarsal osteotomy, you see much better position uh, of the uh, second MTP joint. Um, this is the third, and I'm gonna go through this because we have a lot of images. You can see how the transverse arch also got better with the distal metatarsal osteotomy. You can see how the second and third head went up in relation to the first. Uh, my foot and ankle set uh, went into a slight varus uh, intentionally uh, because I did a cotton. We can talk about that, maybe controversial. This is the patient with three months, and this is a big game changer. That is the amount of uh, uh, residual range of motion that you can get with this procedure that you wouldn't have with an open wire in a flexor to extensor tendon transfer. So this range of motion is game changer for me. You can see that the scar uh, heals usually pretty well. Um, this is the patient with six months. Uh, you can start noticing that you can't really tell anymore which, which foot is uh, the one that had the deformity. This patient was super happy. You can see here with six months. Um, if, I, if you don't pay attention, you won't even notice any significant deformity. The, the, the range of motion is still there as we would expect. Um, I always, I like to show that you ask them to plant their flex, the toes, and they still have uh, uh, some function of the flexor tendons, even though the tendons are loose due to the tenotech. Uh, we run through this, uh, showing the patient now with one year. Uh, these are the x-rays, this is the, the weight burn CT uh, with uh, uh, one year, showing that the joint is still super well positioned. Let me go through this a little bit quicker. Uh, here's a 3D image of the position of the toe. Uh, I wanna show these one. So before and after, one year, uh, we were able to keep the correction. Here's the patient with one year. 
you can't really tell she's happy. She has now the nails are uh, 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 made uh, she, with beautiful nail polish. You see how she's uh, happy and proud of her of her toe, uh, showing the range of motion again, like I said, and uh, active and passive range of motion. Uh, and I do want to get. She just came back uh, last week, maybe or two weeks ago, for her two year post op. And uh, the correction is there. So we're able to maintain the correction. You can see her uh, doing uh, active range of motion and, and the passive range of motion is preserved. And I do want to share with you the image of the wave brand CT showing that we still have a very top second MTP joint um, that is pretty uh, remarkable in my opinion uh, for a two year follow up. And here you can see uh, the rate bearing CT with a heel osteotomy. Um, in a well positioned um, uh, second, you see that my, my fourth distal metatarsal is a little bit too distal. Sometimes you don't see full healing of that. She has no symptoms on the fourth metatarsal there. That's all I had, Jim. Sorry, I always go over time. I apologize. That was terrific. Hang on, I might mute myself. On, I'm on my phone and on my computer. Do a double, double time here. That was great. Um, you, how do you get a patient like that to come in at two years? <laughs> Are you like, well, you have like special candy in your office or something? I mean, that's just wild. Yeah. Well, this is, um, uh, I mean, different practice, right? Academic type of practice. Yeah. Uh, and we can keep, I don't think that Dr. Thorderson, uh would ask the patients to come back with their with two years, but uh, in the university setting, I, I sure. do, uh, I do keep, uh, the follow-ups of my uh, surgical patients. That, that was terrific. Um, I so what we're going to do is we'll we'll hit the questions here at the end. Um, there, are, I think Ben, I had a couple that came in that I sent over to you. Uh, we're going to uh, move on to MPJ instability and a variety of other applications. Uh, we worked on a project with Dr. Thompson, Dr. San Giovanni for years. Literally, it was one of the very first projects we started when I started back here in 2016. Uh, we just commercialized this product earlier this year. It's our paratrooper planner plate system. Um, Dr. Thompson's on the call this evening. Uh, I think Dr. San Giovanni was having some difficulty connecting from Italy. So uh, Dr. Thompson, I'm gonna turn it over to you. He's got an incredible introduction to this product. He's put a bunch of these in already. Uh, and then we'll, we'll pass off to Dr. Chalusin to finish this evening. All right, thank you very much for having me. Uh, so this is gonna go over the paratrooper plantar plate repair system. Uh, the first one went in 19 weeks ago because I just saw the first one back yesterday for a post-op. So again, like Jim had said, it's been about a five to six year adventure, but we're here. Um, so just moving through um, the paratrooper design rationale, just to go over the why we need to do that. You know, some of the other presenters have alluded some of the drawbacks, some of the limitations um, with hammer toe, or with trying to figure out in the completely absent plantar plate or something that works more predictably uh, in their hands. Um, both those hammer tube, the Tino tack are uh, really good compliments to um, having a lot of different strategies for trying to address these. Um, so surgical option, uh, first and foremost, there's a couple different ways you can approach it. Um, some of the uh, repairs are pretty much just putting suture in, trying to pass them through with bone tunnels. Other variations have probably more complicated suture delivery systems. Uh, some of them had different implants, uh, interference screws trying to focus on maybe too much, um, which sounds ideal, but one of the main drawbacks for a lot of uh, implant systems in general uh, would be over-engineering. Uh, so we tried intentionally to avoid doing that, trying to simplify, and obviously there's a lot of expansion and contraction with the scope of what we're trying to work on. Um, but some of these are really challenging. Um, so the um, procedure on the left, I've seen, um, without getting into many details, some of the broken off suture passers uh, still remaining from previous uh, people that referred um, for revisions or other options as well. So we're trying to figure out what to do. Uh, we need something better. Um, so the tissue quality is limited. Uh, so um, same thing, sometimes you don't have the same tissue quality that you would like, and depending on how long the pathology has been going on, if you see people with more long-term plantar plate insufficiency, that crossover toe, you don't have enough tissue to work with. And so certainly having the Tino tack is a good uh, secondary option, um, at least for me, it'd be more of a bailout. Ideally, I'd like to try to do a direct plantar plate repair whenever possible, but we have limited working space. Um, if you're trying to go dorsal, trying to avoid that plantar incision, 
If you're trying to go plantar, trying to avoid more of that dorsal stiffness, uh, we want something that gives us the opportunity and the availability for um, a lot of different uh, approaches for it. We also want good strength of repair. We're talking about tissue that um, is pretty ratty depending on how long it's been worn out and other concomitant issues going on, connected tissue, uh, is not always the same from patient to patient as well. Now, we want other bailout options or at least the ability to be more creative with how we apply these implants and how we try to focus the strategy. Um, certainly, we know that you can go in with a plan and you need to have plan B, C, or D sometimes. Um, already mentioned is that post-op floating toe. Usually, we'll see that for more of an angled uh, plantarly directed while osteotomy uh, with that secondary crossover or that floating toe. Uh, usually that's accentuated if you try to do a rigid hammer toe fixation, especially uh, completely straight. Uh, so um, that's something too that the previous presenters alluded to that patients don't always like it. Uh, that not necessarily even the cause of mesis, but being able to grip the ground, especially people trying to grip um, open toed shoes. Post op compliance is important. Um, you know, we can give patients instructions all we want about the importance of the why and uh, helping them understand why we want them to avoid having those complications. And they'll say they'll walk on their heel or they stay, you know, off of it. And you'll see them leave your office and they're walking completely foot flat or rolling on the outside of their foot. Um, and then, as we mentioned, that stiffness. And one of the things I mentioned earlier was more of an overcomplicated and non, -reprodu uh, non reproducible technique. So it really doesn't matter if I can make this implant work, if nobody else can. Um, if you're on the design team and only one or two people can do it, again, that's not helping patients and it's not making um, people have more options for their armamentarium for how to approach it. Uh, so the difference between this is it's all suture anchor, but it's not just suture. So it's almost like an inchworm. Uh, other uh, things have been described as a sock or a wing nut, as we can see over here uh, when we're trying to pass it. Uh, it allows us to grab fixation in both the soft tissue as well as on the bone side. And it gives you, again, a lot of um, creativity, a lot of variety in terms of how you can deploy it, dorsal versus plantar, all bone, proximal or distal to a while osteotomy with or without a while osteotomy. And it just gives the surgeons a lot more ability to uh, make adjustments uh, intraoperatively. Certainly we can plan as much as we want, but sometimes things come at you that are a little bit surprising. So the key features and benefits of this is the ability to sequentially tension it. Uh, so the standard repair that we mentioned earlier relies on the hand tying of knots. And so one of the challenges, once you tie that knot and you try to put that locking secondary knot on top, if you're not happy with it, if your assistant maybe loses focus, or if you just don't have the position that you thought it would be, you can lose that fixation. And then at that point, it becomes increasingly more difficult to try to set that tension if you can't set it down. And so the dual implant construct allows you to independently tension each individual anchor, and it holds it temporarily to where you can actually make adjustments. If you think you over tighten it, you can loosen it a little bit, and then you can tension the other side to try to address that. Um, and specifically in multiple planes. And so again, like I mentioned, you can address different types of pathology depending on what you have to work with. Some people have no plantar plate, some people have plenty, some people have more uh, of the medial tissue intact and the lateral tissue is attenuated as well. It's minimal bone removal. Um, all that you really need is a 1.4 millimeter K wire that we use to drill the bone tunnels. And it's something that as long as uh, you remove some of the limiting factors, specifically soft tissue or some of the suture uh, management type of issues, you should be able to pass that through fairly easily with that. Uh, and again, it was designed in mind with both the plantar or dorsal ability uh, to be customized to fit the surgeon's needs or the patient needs or both. Uh, it's also a stronger implant than just the pure suture. Uh, the typical repairs are done with either a 2-0 or a zero suture. And so that can lead to some soft tissue pull out, weak repair, and again, as we've probably seen before, you can put one suture in, you try to tension it and it pulls right through, uh, just like the cheese cutter almost. Um, and then universal usage, like we mentioned. Uh, so there's two different anchors, tensioning anchors and the shuttle anchor uh, that sit, depending on how you deploy it uh, on the plantar plate, on plantar plate or plantar plate to bone. The needle is attached. Uh, there is not a separate, um, uh, basically, uh, deployment device uh, that's in there or a suture passer separate um, to go through the soft tissues. And uh, once you can get a couple uh, repetitions under your belt, then really the suture management becomes a lot more straightforward with it. Uh, it's color coded two different implants. 
and the uh, shuttling suture is always black. The instrumentation is also streamlined. So our system has a wild clamp that you can use, which has been specifically designed to avoid that really lengthy clamp. Uh, so if you have a very small window in which you're working, but you have a very long clamp, again, it can slip, it can fall, and it can also put excessive torque and more of a dorsiflexion motion on it. Uh, if you need to use a McGlamry elevator, there's an 11 millimeter McGlamry that comes with the set. I'm pretty limited with how much I use that McGlamry because if you try to aggressively strip and try to mobilize that joint, I think you're more likely going to see one of these horizontal type cleft tears in that plantar plate. And so obviously you don't want to weaken what you're trying to repair. And we also have this pin distractor um, and then a needle driver uh, that is designed to be able to grip that needle appropriately. Uh, then we also have this retractor, uh, which is a previous iteration from um, some uh, earlier designs uh, and people that want to use a plantar approach. It's a combination of Wheatlander and Gelpie, um, if that's something that people wanted to use as it's on there. Uh, so there's the implant tray. We also have peel pack implants and then the inserter kit as well. Uh, so the implants come two to a pack. Uh, they're uh, packaged just like this with the suture uh, that's in there loaded up and you just grab the needle and you pull it straight out. Uh, and then you do not have to do anything else to try to adjust it. Um, and there's a couple uh, tips and tricks to try to avoid getting those tangled up. Uh, the wild kits as well, um, if you want to use and go for more a dorsal approach, it has two different suture retrievers, uh, 4K wires, all the same size, all smooth, and then a monster bite driver uh, with two screws, a monster bite 11 millimeter and the 13 millimeter, depending on the size uh, of the metatarsal head. And if you feel like you need a second point of fixation for the wild osteotomy, um, probably nine and a half times out of 10, I just need a single screw to put that in. So there are different approaches, like we mentioned. Uh, the uh, picture on the left is probably more the standard one that I use, which is a dorsal approach with a wild osteotomy, uh, putting the anchor in uh, on the plantar plate and then securing on the dorsum of it. Um, for me, I would say I do mine a little bit different where I put my anchor sock in between the plantar plate and the metatarsal head. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that, but you can do it either way, really whatever uh, works best in the hand of the surgeon. Joint spanning collaterals where you take your um, anchor and your implant more proximal to the wild osteotomy. Um, if you need to do that. And then also uh, the uh, plantar approach, um, if you want to secure that um, directly into it um, with or without that wild osteotomy. Technique overview, and then we have a short animation as well as a technique video. Uh, so once you've completed your osteotomy, if that's something that you're planning to do and you've released that plantar plate off of uh, the proximal phalanx and you pass your suture anchors and you briefly uh, set them down, tension them, and then you drill your crossing bone tunnels in the base of the proximal phalanx. You set the tension, you set the position of the wild osteotomy, and you cinch down your implants. Uh, once you're satisfied with that, you tie them individually, and then usually I will tie them uh, over that bony bridge as well. Uh, I like crossing tunnels. You can also do parallel tunnels if that's something that you would prefer. Here's our animation just to take you through it. There's a couple things that I agree with, some things I might do differently. And this is primarily just the dorsal approach that we'll go over today. So this is actually how I usually have my implants with the sock in between that metatarsal head and the plantar plate. I think it advances it a little bit better and secures it and the friction of the flexor tendons is uh, something that I would uh, try to avoid rubbing on that implant, but I don't think it has any huge drawbacks either way. Uh, dorsal incision centered right over that MTP joint, releasing the collaterals off the base and the proximal phalanx, and then trying to avoid very much soft tissue dissection on that metatarsal head side. Uh, plantar flex in that second toe, and then allows it to make that wild osteotomy. Uh, usually I'll make it about one or two millimeters inferior to that lip. And then often if I have to do more than maybe one to two millimeters of shortening, I'll take a parallel bone wedge uh, to try to make sure I avoid that plantar translation. Again, like I mentioned, I don't routinely use a glamoury and I would do it before the while if I was gonna do that. And I usually also plan my wire to where I'm gonna use that to actually put my monster bite screw in. Uh, you can alternatively leave that in and put a second one in, but I like to plan it uh, just to have that one hole in it. Um, Base of the proximal phalanx wire distractor, opens the joint. I release the remnant of that plantar plate, and then I usually use a freer elevator to sweep off 
the flexor tendons and sometimes a tenotomy scissor to try to make sure if there's any slips around that flexor tendon sheath to avoid it. Uh, the anchor usually, uh, since I'm right-handed, I'll put in uh, the one to my left uh, first. If it's a right foot, it'll be the lateral anchor. If it's the left foot, it'll be the medial anchor. Pass it through and then cinch it down gently. You don't want to over tension this right now. You just want to pass it through to engage that plantar plate. So you put the opposing side in and then usually just taking them and laid them on the dorsum just to avoid that suture uh, tangling. So as is demonstrating here, we seat that tension anchor uh, just gently and then suture management. So at this point you have the shuttling suture on both sides as well as the tensioning suture and the shuttle suture. So you plantar flex, but you leave that pin in that base of the proximal phalanx like a joystick. You can really control it very well. I like crossing bone tunnels. Um, there's some people who are pretty against it. I think there's more bone. I think you um, are a lot safer in that way you don't strip out or lose a lateral cortex or medial cortex. Shuttling sutures, um, the main difference I wouldn't do on there is you want to have as little of the overlapping suture as possible just because it makes it easier to pass. And there's uh, another key point that I'll show a little bit later on. Once you pass them, I would remove the proximal phalanx pin and then I would check my cascade radiographically and then I will put my monster bite screw in that metatarsal head. After that, like we said, we tension one implant individually. I like to alternate either one just to make sure I like that three-dimensional position. I tie them independently on each anchor and then tie them over that bone bridge and just seat them uh, flush with about maybe a one to two millimeter tail. Here's a video that we shot in the lab uh, back in, I think, January, February. Dr. Sanjivani and myself uh, working on this dissection. Dorsal approach. Uh, so then I sharply dissect, I release the tendon sheath along the extensor tendons. And then depending on what you need to do, we'll either tenotomize the EDB or just move it gently. Uh, and then Z lengthen the extensor digitorum longus. Perform your capsulotomy. Uh, sometimes it's nice to be able to try to repair that if you can, but sometimes that tissue is also stretched out or attenuated. So being cautious uh, to avoid incising that dorsal cartilage on that metatarsal head. And we expose it, gently retract. And again, this is some sharp dissection right off of the base of the proximal phalanx, releasing the collaterals. gentle while, excuse me, McGlamory, so not much. Uh, I don't take it super deep. And this has the base of the proximal phalanx wire distractor in. You can sharply release the plantar plate. You can see it very distinctly in the specimen and the flexor tendon is deep to it. Uh, so then taking the implant, passing it through. And again, you can do it either way. I like to actually take that sock uh, dorsal to the plantar plate because there's less friction between the metatarsal head and between the plantar plate as compared to the flexor tendons. Um, but really, I don't think it matters that much. I do think though that if you have the sock in this position, I think it advances with um, a little bit more tissue that you can apply. Uh, the main trick if you're putting the sock dorsally is trying to be able to pass that um, implant through. If you put it on the plantar side, it's easier to pass this way. Um, but I've not had any difficulty with either the cadaver or any of the patients I've put in. I put in several now uh, with that passing through. It usually just pops right through. Now, the other thing that's encouraging is there's a good hard stop, so it makes you feel a lot more confident about the bite that you have in that plantar plate. So now we have both of our anchors in with good grip on it. So there's no pull through, and we're pulling pretty hard uh, on this one. And so you can see here we're drilling our crossing bone tunnels. I go slightly distal, medial to proximal plantar lateral. I like them angled down and just trying to protect the soft tissues. I like to be able to see it and use about one millimeter proximal to the articular surface all on that plantar lip of the proximal phalanx is where I'm trying to aim to pass it through. I think this is hugely important, uh, passing both of the suture passers through. That way you don't cross thread and you can actually go through one of the other implants. Um, so I've not done on this kit. It's happened to me one time before on a previous implant system, which can be pretty frustrating if you actually go through um, your 
suture on the other implant with the suture passer uh, and they're cross-threaded and then you have to start over from that too. So you can pass just that needle through, it makes it a little bit easier to pass through and then you can cut uh, right after that or you can just pass them in individually independent of that needle if you want and go ahead and clip it. So once you have these passed through then you can pull it through and again stopping there you don't want to pull all the way through it uh, and again the black one is the tensioning suture and so we're pulling it up to it and just trying to take out some of the slack but not overly tensioning it so this is this alligator roll technique that you can see and you can do both or you can just do the single implant uh, or excuse me or the single uh, tensioning suture just with the black but that popped through very nicely. This is after we pass that second one. We're using this wild clamp to secure it. Uh, there's no spikes. It has more surface area. That way you're not penetrating and poking holes in that bone, trying to gain that fixation. And there's plenty of room that you can remove the wire and then you can put in your uh, monster bite screw. So you can hold it in place. A lot of times I'll leave that uh, wild clamp on uh, when I'm breaking that off. That way you have some extra fixation, a lot less torque on that metatarsal wild osteotomy. And this is as we're setting that tension, we hold that second toe in that plantar flex, proximally translated position, and then alternatively uh, tensioning each individual anchor. So now that we've tensioned it down appropriately, we check and make sure we're satisfied with that. And then we'll tie each suture knot to secure each individual anchor and then tie them over that bone bridge together. leaving about maybe a two millimeter tail just to make sure it doesn't unwind. And that repair is good and solid. So the main benefits, uh, like I mentioned previously, all suture anchor system, versatile approaches, both dorsal and plantar. You can get creative with the applications as well. If you want to just do a collateral ligament alone, you can do that uh, with or without any kind of osteotomy. Um, I prefer to complete the tear and then repair it just to basically start fresh. You can do a plantar reefing uh, if you don't want to do any kind of dorsal approach, if you just want to try to repair more of that attenuated tissue and combine all these things as well. I've also used it on a hallux uh, for a, a complete plantar plate tear, which I'll show a case on that shortly. Uh, I like the streamlined instrumentation. Uh, the OR staff likes it a lot too. Uh, it's a much cleaner back table, a lot fewer uh, things have to try to keep track of as well. And again, the implants. Uh, and the inserter kit are all sterile peel packed. Uh, the tension is adjustable and it's easy to set without slipping. So you don't have to have three to four hands that know what's going on. And then it, it's a lot more workable in these tight spaces in which we're doing. Uh, so just a few clinical cases. So this is actually the first patient. Uh, so 69 year old woman with long standing hallux valgus and cross of her toe. Uh, well known to me, I treated her for years. Uh, she had a third metatarsal stress fracture that healed non-operatively. She had some uh, posterior tibialis tendon dysfunction issues, some sinus tarsus syndrome that we treated uh, non-surgically with some physical therapy, some orthotic insoles. And then she came back. Uh, she's very active, uh, works out. She likes to lift weights, um, doing squats, leg presses, and those kind of things. And uh, what always struck me on her was she always had purple hair. And she came back, and her hair was uh, dark and gray. And I asked her why her hair wasn't purple. And she said that she was too depressed uh, because after she'd had her knee replacement done, she was hoping to be able to have her life back and be more active. And so she wasn't planning to do it until she got her hair purple again. And I thought this is a perfect patient uh, with the purple hair given Paragon's theme. Uh, so on her radiograph, she had a lot of these things that have already been mentioned. She's got a malfunctioning first ray. Uh, she does have some mild hypermobility along the first ray. She has hallux valgus with some degenerative changes. Uh, she has that long second metatarsal relative to the first and the third. She also has that 
hyperextension of the first MT, excuse me, the second MTP joint, that plantar flexion, um, flexion contracture, the PIP joint. And it's also exacerbated by that third metatarsal stretch fracture with a little bit of shortening as well. And she also had some secondary degeneration with some arthritis along that second metatarsal head, uh, which gave us a little bit more of a um, challenge, maybe not necessarily challenge, but just something we need to consider when we're making our wild osteotomy cuts. Um, a lot of times with arthritis, especially like in a Freiberg's infraction type of patient, that dorsal central one third has that subchondral cyst formation, that uh, chondral wear. So a lot of times they'll do a hybrid dorsiflexion, a wild shortening osteotomy uh, to be able to try to engage more of that plantar cartilage. And it also translate more of that plantar plate distally to allow for better repair. So these are her surgical pictures. Um, I don't have any weight bearing clinical pictures before. I apologize for that. But on a simulated weight bearing, we see that crowding, we see that elevation, and we see that callus along that PIP joint on the second toe. So for her, I did a first MTP joint arthrodesis at the same time. We started with that and then moved forward with the plantar plate of the paratrooper system. So for her, I tenotomized the EDB. I do a proximal tenotomy. That way I can try to take that and incorporate that in my repair. And then I did a Z lengthening of the EDL. And then this um, third picture from the left, uh, you can see that plantar flexion and that position. Um, here's a better picture of her osteotomy. So I took a pretty large wedge and did a dorsiflexion. She had a hypertrophic second metatarsal head as well. So that gave us plenty of bone to work with. And I did a closing wedge trying to remove some of the essential wear. And then I put my wire in uh, to try to uh, plan for this um, monster bite screw to go through that same hole. The other thing too, if you look at that third picture from the left again, you can see the angle that that pin makes. Um, so if you pay close attention to these metatarsals on that cascade, the less metatarsals usually supinate and so when you're making your wild osteotomy cut, when you're doing that, you just have to make sure that you consider the actual anatomy of that third metatarsal, whether or not you're going parallel to or perpendicular if you need to do it, but basically how it relates to the weight bearing surface of the ground um, versus the actual anatomy of that metatarsal. Uh, then we have our wire distractor on the right. Uh, we can see the flexor tendons when we go through this approach, and this is uh, me grabbing that plantar plate. And then you can see that central chondral wear portion that she still had some remaining as well, um, but had good motion. So this is us passing our suture. Uh, we had the first anchor in place, and then we passed our second one uh, without too much difficulty. I think this picture on the far right does a really good job of showing how those anchors sit, uh, engage huge about two to three millimeters proximal to the edge of that plantar plate on either side of that flexor tendon complex. So um, really no um, friction issues uh, at all on this one. And then we are making our crossing drill tunnels. And then if I had to pick one slide that is probably the most important, it would be this one, uh, which shows that you have both of these suture passers in place before you shuttle any sutures. And again, this will prevent you 100% from uh, buttonholing or spearing through the other implant. And so once you have these two in place and you have plenty of room and you can see that you can shuttle these sutures uh, pretty easily, uh, then we pass them through. And then it can be a little bit um, of uh, some suture management issues if you're not used to it, but as long as you know where things are and that you don't loop around uh, the actual um, suture limbs around that pin that you have uh, holding your wild osteotomy in place, then you should be good to go and having a good assistant that can kind of keep an eye out there for you. Uh, the picture on the right shows you need to have that shuttling implant anchor um, straight. And so if you think about this as an inchworm, it can't be bunched up at all. And whenever you're passing it, otherwise you won't be able to pull it through. Here's that wild clamp and it shows that securing that we're uh, doing there and that monster bite screw. And then I usually like to use my saw uh, to remove that dorsal lip. I think there's a lot more control to it. And I think it's a lot easier than trying to use a um, clip or any kind of like ronger to try to remove it. Here's a shuttling and tensioning. And then the final repair, I repaired the uh, two limbs, the EDB and the EDL uh, distal limb back to that proximal portion of the EDL. And then uh, as Dr. Caesar mentioned, that wrapping is important. I also do something similar where I try to use this more of a dorsal check rein and then gently wrap it. And then you drop tourniquet and make sure that uh, you have uh, five out of five toes, nice and pink. Six weeks post-op, uh, here's the patient. Um, so that uh, incision looks well. She's got some swelling. So on the second toe dorsally, uh, she has some of that callus that was sloughing off that she had from before. A little bit of swelling that we can see, but she's able to grip the ground pretty easily. Uh, and then uh, here's a graph. We a little bit of swelling. 
thing that I always find interesting is that when I fuse the first MTP joint, some of that first tarsal and tarsal sag goes away. Uh, so I think you can correct that. And the other thing too is that first, second intermetatarsal angle also uh, corrects in that same uh, degree. Um, and so for me, I think that a first MTP joint fusion is a very powerful operation. Uh, and then uh, that while osteotomy looks well aligned, a little bit of degenerative change on that second metatarsal head, but we saw that uh, preoperatively as well. So this was yesterday. Um, this is 19 weeks post-op. Uh, so here she is, pretty minimal swelling. Uh, she has uh, excellent alignment with her toes, a lot better than it was before. And uh, her purple hair was back. And so uh, she was very excited. So here's our final radiogram. So she's pure in follow-up right now. So a little bit more settling of that foot now that she feels more uh, confident putting it down. Um, but she's got good alignment and that second toe is sitting down where it needs to be. The arthrodesis is nice and solid. No issues with the osteotomy. Uh, so 19 weeks out, she's no pain, back in the gym. She's in her regular shoes and she actually says she doesn't want any orthotics. She feels most comfortable uh, walking barefoot and her purple hair was back. Uh, this is uh, another patient that was a 44 year old gentleman who had a worker's compensation injury uh, treated by another uh, provider for an ipsilateral fibula fracture, treated non-op um, that went on to heal fine. He had some soreness initially that was picked up in the first couple weeks with that, but was not formally evaluated on the forefoot until about six weeks out from the injury. Um, then that provider got an MRI that demonstrated high grade plantar plate tearing of that hallux. Uh, so um, that provider referred the patient to me. Uh, this gentleman uh, was at that point about five months out from his injury. Uh, he had some sesamoid retraction on that left as compared to the right. Um, so uh, we had this available. So we thought we'd try it. So we made a uh, medial approach, cheating slightly plantar for it. Uh, and then uh, as we came down, uh, we were able to identify the sesamoids and so portions of the um, sesamoid phalangeal ligament were still intact. So we were able to dock those ligaments, uh, or excuse me, the anchors into that uh, ligament attachment point. As we uh, passed it through, we were able to gain good fixation. And then we made a open uh, approach, mini open on the dorsal aspect of that proximal phalanx on the great toe. Passing the anchors through, as you can see, we had that first metatarsal head and we have these anchors again in both the uh, medial and the lateral sesamoid uh, phalangeal uh, ligaments on either side of the FHL, just dissecting out the FHL tract to make sure that we didn't spear that tendon. This is making that counter incision, passing it through. And this um, picture on the far right shows the attachment of that uh, sesamoid phalangeal ligament before we tension it. So, we then hold that great toe in a slightly plantar flex position, trying to avoid any kind of over tensioning, uh, and then uh, secured and tied the knots and did, did the rest of the soft tissue repair with the abductor halysis along that capsule as well. Post operating graphs uh, on the left as compared to the right, I think it's a little better. Um, you know, we're really just looking at about maybe one to two millimeters of uh, position change for that, um, but it gave me a nice option to try to repair that directly without having to do any kind of fusion or any other kind of. Um, bulkier uh, implant or dissection for that as well. He saw a little bit of pain, but um, overall much better than he was before. Still working on rehab as well. Again, this is something that was uh, dealt more with that five months out uh, from this acute plantar plate injury uh, from that as well. Probably the surgical pearls, the tips and tricks that I would say, uh, like I already mentioned uh, by the uh, previous presenters, is carefully consider first ray pathology, aching osteotomy, arthrodesis, lapidus procedure, uh, motion preserving, either proximal or distal chevron osteotomy, um, or proximal metatarsal osteotomy, I think is very important. If there's any kind of crowding or any overload, you need to make sure you understand it. I would really also encourage uh, avoiding excessive top tissue stripping on that metatarsal head. You don't want to kill the metatarsal head based on that blood supply. Um, and then again, I would avoid excessive myglamory stripping plantarly as well, just trying to make sure that you don't create more trauma to the tissue that you're trying to repair. Um, if you can't pass the needle in the constraints of the tissue or the space, then just try different angles to pass it through it. It does take a little bit of getting used to um, in terms of trying to pass it through. Sometimes it might be more of a punch rather than a, a gentle wrist uh, rotation. Uh, suture management is in all caps. Um, I tell people in terms of our uh, orthopedic colleagues who may have done rotator cuff repairs previously, it's all about suture management. Uh, and it's something that um, can get overwhelming the more suture because you're talking about two different tensioning limbs, two different uh, shuttle limbs. Um, that you're trying to basically make sure you don't tangle and you have issues with that. But as long as you can get over that, 
uh, hump initially and you can understand what goes where, then uh, it's pretty straightforward. I would place both of the passers in before you shuttle the suture. And if the anchor doesn't pass through that phalanx fairly easily, don't be afraid to back it up and then reassess. Sometimes you need to clear out some of the soft tissue that's there on the proximal phalangeal base. Sometimes you need to undo some of the bunching. If again, that inchworm uh, bunches up a little bit, or sometimes, and I had this one today, I did one where one of the um, limbs was actually on the other side and was buttonholed through it. So, um, or excuse me, not buttonholed through it, but it was uh, caught. So I was trying to shuttle them through at the same time. You can try to adjust some of the tension um, on your tensioning sutures, try to get out of the way. Uh, but what we ended up doing was this alligator roll technique with the hemostat where you grip it and you roll it together. That gives you a lot more of a pull. Um, and it avoids cutting through your gloves or trying to rip out the implant. It gives it much more of a controlled pull. Uh, alternate the tension, like we mentioned previously. And I would also encourage people to tonotomize the EDB and Z-Link from the EDL for the first few cases at least. I try to avoid it when I can. Um, one of the things that was mentioned by the previous presenters um, was that stiffness that people get dorsally. And it's true, uh, they do. Um, and they also mentioned patient expectations, which is huge for sure. So usually what I try to tell people is that I'm trying to organize scar. And so what we want to try to do is have more scar plantarly than dorsally, because that's what the issue is, that plantar stretching. And so the physical therapy, doing intrinsic muscle strengthening, those towel crunches, those marble pickups as well can really help. And then also a uh, passive plantar flexion with some scar massage dorsally can also help really alleviate a lot of that dorsal scarring that people can see. If you can avoid doing anything to the eccentric tendons, um, then that can help. It does make it a little bit more technically challenging, um, but if you're doing more of an aggressive while osteotomy, then you usually can take enough tension off or you don't have to do that. Um, if they're contracted, then you know feel free to do it. It gives you plenty of room uh, to work. But um, the other thing is that if you do leave the eccentric tendons in place, just keep in mind that when you're putting on the distractor, uh, that it usually tends to um, rotate externally. And so just have to be prepared for that when you're trying to access the joint. Dr. Thompson, thank you very much. Awesome introduction to that system. There are tons and tons of applications there. That was, that was pretty cool to see and you've done quite a few of these already. There, there were a couple questions that came through that we'll hit at the end here. Um, Dr. Toulousen has some uh, research that he and colleagues have done at the University of Michigan on planner play. He's been worked closely with us, um, provided that research to us. Uh, and so I, was, I asked him to jump on and present a little bit of that tonight, but also he's done a, done a ton of these cases and has a passion for this, for this pathology and repair. So great to have you on Dr. Toulousen. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, so the, you know, the title of the talk is addressing forefoot pathology and just the experience in my practice. So, um, I'll throw a little of our research into there. Um, and, uh, you know, talk about some cases and just some of my thoughts in general about how I approach, um, the MTP joints and like the lesser toes and hammer toes, because they're, they're all pretty connected. Um, so, I mean, this is the planner plate. I don't know how many people have had the opportunity to just, you know, see it, but you know, it, it's connecting the phalanx to the, um, to the metatarsal neck here. Uh, one important thing to note um, is that proximally there isn't just one attachment. There's sort of, it's sort of Y shaped. So, uh, the planner plate comes along proximally and then it sort of splits. And so it sends one, uh, one connecting branch up to the metatarsal and then the other part of it comes out here and then blends in with the plantar fascia. Um, the, um, you know, what happens when the planter plate stops working, whether it tears or stretches, so it loses the ability to resist dorsiflexion of the MTP joint. And so the, the, basically the toe pops up. And when that happens, um, after the MTP joint dorsiflexes, is that you will get uh, the intrinsic tendon, the intrinsic tendons will displace dorsally. And they'll, they'll go dorsal to the center of rotation of the MTP joint, which turns them into MTP joint extensors, which is going to make your deformity worse. And then as the... Uh, MTP joint is dorsiflex, the long flexor tendons become stretched. And then what happens then is you get flexion of the, uh, the interphalangeal joints. 
And then, you know, at first it's usually a flexible deformity and then over time it becomes a fixed contracture. Um, also important when talking about the MTP joint is the collateral ligaments. Um, so over here is the phalanx, here is the metatarsal head, and then uh, coming from the lateral and medial epicondyles of the, um, of the metatarsal, um, it sends out two bands and those attach sort of plantarly um, on the phalanx. So like when the, when the collateral ligaments aren't working very well, um, then you'll get lateral or medial deviation of, of the lesser toes. Um, and if it's the plantar plate and the collateral ligaments, that's when the toe will pop up, but then we'll also start crossing over. So it's important to sort of have those things in mind. When addressing these things, you know, people always talk about techniques and what's your technique for this or technique for that. I mean, I, I, I actually, I hate the word technique because like techniques change, you know, and if you think about bunions from, you know, the beginning of time until now, I mean, there's over like 200 different bunion operations, but what doesn't change is the principles. And so I think that it's really important to just always keep principles in mind um, so that it allows you to do good surgeries. Um, so the principles of the hammer toes, so we have to straighten them and then we have to keep them there. And so dependent, you have to examine the patient and figure out what's going on um, so that what you do to address the deformity will like stick around, you know? So sometimes it's fusing the toes. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, that's in the case of like a fixed contracture with new capsule releases, if they're sort of kind of fixed, but kind of flexible. And then sometimes you don't have to do anything to the PIP joints and the DIP joints because it's a flexible hammer toe. And then by like reducing the MTP joints, the PIP and DIP joints will, will become happy. So uh, it's really important to sort of understand that. Um, after getting the tissues to be, uh, you know, after getting the toe straight and stabilized, you have to worry about balance in, in the soft tissues, particularly with uh, the extensors and the flexors. And so, you know, one of the things that happens is you fuse the, 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 the PIP joint and then what happens to the DIP joint? Sometimes it's fine, sometimes it isn't. And so sometimes you have to anticipate um, if you do a PIP fusion, what's gonna happen to the, T, to, to the DIP joint and you might end up with a post-op mallet toe or something. So you, have to, you really have to be aware of that and then you know, try to recognize that intraoperatively and then you may have to fuse the DIP joint. Um, so uh, just to kind of a couple cases of, of where I've done some PIP fusions. I know that you know, we've seen a bunch of these, but here are some of mine. So, um, you know, this is a case where, you know, it's, it's very rarely just a hammer toe. It's almost always a hammer toe with a plantar plate because basically, plant, in my mind, plantar plates or plantar plate insufficiency is what, is what causes hammer toes. So in a case like this, we have a uh, dislocation of the second and third MTP joints with um, rigid hammer toes. And so in this case, I did a plantar plate repair to uh, restore uh, and reduce the MTP joints. And then I did PIP fusions uh, here with uh, some hammer tubes. Um, and um, another case uh, here is another PIP fusion um, in the setting of hallux rigidus with some hallux valgus. So, you know, you got to get the big toe out of the way, um, whether it's a fusion, a bunionectomy, or an aiken or something like that. But you got to get the big toe out of the way. Uh, make room for the second toe. Um, and this is a case where the plantar plate wasn't too bad. So I did a, uh, a PIP fusion. Now I, I mentioned the, the iatrogenic mallet toe before. Um, and uh, here's a case where I learned the hard way. Um, so, you know, preoperatively here, they have flexion of the PIP joints. And um, what I thought was that the DIP joints looked pretty straight here. So I went and uh, here's their, here's their pre-op x-rays. So I did some plantar plate repairs. Um, I did a PIP fusion and, uh, and then we closed everything up. Now, what I didn't really recognize was what's going on at the, D, uh, at the distal interphalangeal joint here. So here the toe doesn't look straight. It's kind of flexed at the, uh, at the DIP joint. And um, you know, again, you can see it here where the toe is kind of pretty straight. We've got the hammer tube in here. Um, but there's just some flexion of the, of the DIP joint there. And so fast forward postoperatively, they ended up with this mallet toe. Um, 
And I did a flexor tenotomy and everything was fine after that. But, you know, I did have to sort of tuck my tail in between my legs and say, yeah, we're not really done with you. Um, I mean, it was an office procedure to do the flexor tenotomy, but it would have been much cooler if I recognized this intraoperatively and did the flexor tenotomy at the time of uh, her initial surgery. So um, just try to keep that in mind uh, before you leave the operating room. Um, principles of the of the MTP joint. So you know, whenever I um, am on panels like this, or or anytime I hear someone talk about uh, the MTP joint or hammer toes and things like that, you know, it's always it, it always starts off with you know we all hate this, nobody likes it, um, you know this is the worst thing. Um, and so I'm the weird guy who like loves the MTP joint, and, like loves planar plate repairs and everything. But, um, you know, again, though, you know, there's lots of different ways and we've heard a bunch today about how we address instability at the MTP joint, but we have to go with principles. So the principle is if it's unstable at the MTP joint plantarly, you have to restore the stability. And so I don't really care how anybody goes about it, as long as they're adhering to the principle of restore the stability. Same thing with restoring collateral um, ligament instability in the cases of um, um, like axial plane uh, deformity. So when it comes to restoring planar stability, things you can do. So there's metatarsal shortening osteotomies, like you know, while osteotomies, et cetera, planar plate repairs, tenotomies, tendon transfers. And then there's the old fashioned, just pin it and let it scar in. Um, and then with collateral ligaments, you know, there's, there's collateral ligament repair and invocation. There's flexor to extensor transfers. Um, and then uh, again, the old pin and scar technique. Um, here's a case where I, uh, it was a little earlier on in my practice, really before I kind of got into the plantar plate stuff. Um, so, you know, she's got, uh, she had a previous bunionectomy done elsewhere. She had long second and third metatarsals, the, the second MTP joints dislocated, and she's got rigid hammer toes of two and three. Um, so this is a case where, you know, you have to restore, if the, if the metatarsals are long, you have to shorten. So, uh, and, you know, my go-to is a, is a while osteotomy typically. Um, and then these are where I pinned the hammer toes. And then the second MTP joint was not stable. So I pinned across it. Um, but, um, I think a lot of this is helped just by shortening the metatarsals in these cases where the metatarsals are long. Um, just a, another sort of pin and let it scar in. This lady had a previous, uh, uh, bunion and her second and third toes were, uh, dislocated at the MTP joints. Um, so here I did hammer tubes. Um, and what I like about hammer tubes is, um, that they have a hole in the middle. So if you need to go and pin the MTP joint, then you do it. I don't do it that often because I'm scared of an infection kind of traveling down the pin through the, you know, infecting the hammer tube and then getting into the metatarsals. Um, and I mean, it's rare. I haven't seen it, but certainly it's a theoretical thing. So, um, you know, be at least think about it before you put a pin down the hammer tubes, but, um, but it is nice that you're able to do it with the straight hammer tubes. Um, and so, um, you know, coming to like what I, what I, what I really love is planar plate repairs and, um, you know, so here's just doing the exam. This is the unstable, uh, planar plate, uh, on the, on the right side there. The goal that I try to do is pass a mattress stitch. Um, it's, uh, it isn't exactly the paratrooper, but I'm also not trying to compete with Paragon and anything. But um, now I do do a McGlamory, but I'm gonna talk about why I don't like to do it anymore. Um, so, but I do a little plantar condylectomy. This is how I pass the stitch. And like, you know, this is well before, or this is actually th something I sort of developed, if you wanna call it that, um, because I hated all the other systems that were out there. Um, and so I kind of just take a Keith needle, um, pass it through the planter plate. I typically don't have to do a while for visualization. I might do a while if, they need, if I need to shorten, uh, but I pass a stitch like that um, with, a, with a Keith needle. Um, I usually will do a couple of drill tunnels into the metatarsal and not cut it off with phalanx unless it's really torn off the phalanx. But um, I will typically imbricate it to the metatarsal um, and uh, 
this is my post-op dressing, which uh, is very important. Um, now, why, why do I do it this way? So this is a, this is a study um, that uh, Paragon uh, was very generously funded for us, but it's a micro CT study because we didn't know the blood supply to the plantar plate. And so what we did is we did these micro CTs and stained them in a bunch of different ways to figure out what is the blood supply to the plantar plate. And we found that the, the blood supply comes from the phalanx and it comes from the metatarsal and it also comes from the plantar fascia. So basically put the two ends of the plantar plate and then the middle of the plantar plate basically doesn't really have very good blood supply. Um, and so, um, you know, how is that, how did this study change the way I do things? Well, um, you know, when I first started doing plater plates, um, you know, this was the system, um, that was probably the most well-known and, um, you know, the people who, who came up with this, you know, folks like Kai O'Neary, Mike Coughlin, like, um, we, uh, we owe them a lot for just approaching this problem, uh, in, in this way. Uh, to do like direct plantar plate repairs because nobody was really doing them very much before that. Um, so I have a lot of respect for them for coming up with it, but um, the, you know, just like Caesar was mentioning with the iPhone, like this was the iPhone one. And then over time we have to improve and modify things. So, um, you know, with that technique, you know, one of the things you do is you cut the plantar plate off of the proximal phalanx. So that's insult number one to the plantar plate where you're cutting the blood supply. Um, again, unless it's already torn, that's different, but if it's not torn off the proximal failings, which is the case a lot of the times, because I think a lot of these are just stretched out and attenuated plantar plates. Um, if you don't have to cut it off the failings, I prefer to not cut it off the failings. Um, and then uh, like Dr. Thompson was, was talking about, he tries to avoid sticking a meglamry in there. Uh, well, that's because a meglamry does this, you know, you, you're stripping the, uh, metatarsal origin of the plantar plate and um, a bunch of blood supply. Actually, a study that we're doing now um, is showing that 64% of the proximal blood supply to the plantar plate is actually coming from the metatarsal. So I don't think it's a great idea um, based on our recent studies to stick a meglamry in there if you can avoid it. So try not to do it. Um, and, and, you know, the way I think about sticking the meglamry in there, you know, plus, uh, cutting the uh, plantar plate off of the phalanx. It's like when my kid is trying to charge his iPad and he's sitting this far from the wall, like he doesn't move closer to the wall. He yanks on the cord um, and pulls it out of the wall. And so he's happy that his iPad's plugged in, but it still dies, right? Cause like you just like did all this proximal destruction. So, um, so I think that's kind of where uh, I've evolved in approaching plantar plates. So if I don't have to cut it off the phalanx, I don't. Um, I try not to stick a meglamry in and disrupt the blood supply from the metatarsal. And then even if I do strip things off the metatarsal, uh, one thing that, you know, you should consider is at least repairing, you know, putting some stitches in and imbricating uh, the plantar plate to the metatarsal. Um, and then approaching collateral ligaments, um, you know, I brought the same sort of idea to the collateral ligaments as I did to the plantar plate. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of doing like flexor to extensor transfers. Um, I, I, we didn't do a ton in fellowship. I'm not well versed in it. Plus, you know, we talked to a lot of people doing the flexor to extensor transfers. It doesn't really result in a normal toe. It results in a straight toe, but uh, the function isn't, isn't always that great. So, so in a patient like this, where they have kind of this deviated toe, not much of a plantar plate issue, but the collateral ligament issue. Um, this is, uh, maybe it's a little crazy what I do here, but it's, it's, kind of, it's not that different than what I would do for a plantar plate. The exception is, you know, so I'll drill two tunnels into the metatarsal, but they're going transversely like this. Um, I pass a stitch. The goal is to pass a stitch through the metatarsal um, and then take the two ends of the, meta, of the stitch pass them through the collateral ligament and imbricate them. Um, and so here's kind of it in action. There's the evil meglamory, two transverse drill tunnels. I pass a suture, um, in this case, from medial to lateral. Um, and what I'm left with is this, you know, so I got the, the two stitches or one stitch going through two drill tunnels in the metatarsal. Here are the free ends of the suture. And then the next step is I put on a free needle and I pass them through the collateral ligament, kind of like you'd be doing for a brostrum or something. Um, hold the toe over, tie the stitches into the imbricated 
collateral ligament and provided there's good tissue on the on the collateral um, and then so here on the left is before and then on the right is about six months after um, and uh, so far these have been these have been holding up pretty well and it's not that difficult to do um, so here's uh, here's just another case of that um, or here's a before and after um, x-rays um, about six months later um, tendon transfers. So like I mentioned, I don't really do many tendon transfers, but since I've learned about the Tenotac, which in my mind is essentially a tendon transfer, um, and uh, Caesar showed some great cases where, where, you know, function is restored very well. These are not my cases, but I stole these x-rays. Um, but I think, I think the Tenotac definitely has its place. Um, for me, it would be something where like, it was a really, really big, uh, really big deformity where, you know, there is no plantar plate in there. Um, is a case where I think that I, I would like to use Tino tax. Um, and I lost track of time, but I think I got a couple more minutes. Just going through a couple. Um, am I good? Should I stop? You're, I'm happy to you're stop. good. No, you're good. Okay. Keep going. This is great. Yeah. Uh, so here's just a couple cases. 56 year old guy um, with bilateral uh, MTP joint dislocations and hammer toes. Um, and so I'm one of the crazy people who will do bilateral surgery. I thought it would take like an hour, but it ended up being like four. So, uh, but anyways, with this gentleman, um, did plantar plate repairs, uh, as I showed in that video. Um, and then I, he got hammer tubes in, uh, two, three, and four. Um, admittedly, so, you know, as we let down the tourniquet, his toes, you know, he's been dislocated and everything for so long, his toes turned kind of white and we were having a little bit of trouble pinking up, um, and so, you know, when in fellowship and stuff, we were taught, you know, pull the wire, do all these things. And uh, in these cases, like, you know, what do you do when the toe turns white? Um, luckily, we uh, did the tricks of, um, you know, warm saline sponges. Um, and then his perfusion came back uh, very quickly after that. So, uh, but, you know, it did, did cause a little bit of rectal tone. Um, and then uh, here's another case. So this was, um, Again, kind of learning the hard way, 28 year old um, who had an unfortunate like cardiac arrest um, for just a congenital heart abnormality several, several years prior. She ended up with spastic hemiparesis. And so her issue here was that she had kind of a bunion, but it was more of like hallux valgus interphalangeus. And then she had um, a uh, hammer toe. Uh, of the second with no, without plantar plate issue there. So um, here's her x-rays. And so I said, okay, I gotta get the big toe out of the way. Um, and in someone with spastic hemiparesis, you know, either do an osteotomy or a fusion. I, so I said, all right, okay, I'll do an IP fusion, um, sort of an achy fusion to try to straighten out the toe. Um, and then I did a hammer tube. And so leaving the operating room, it was amazing. And then she followed up and like within a couple of months, um, she started drifting into hallux valgus. And then a year later, she finally was like, I can't take this anymore. And then up here, you can see the toes, silicone toe spacer that she like refused to get rid of. So I said, fine, okay, well, we'll fuse your MTP joint. And the whole time this uh, hammer tube is holding up pretty well. Um, so did a first MTP fusion, thought everything was great, but it's a little grainy here. But the issue was that she was still rubbing between these two toes here. Um, so then another year later, when I were at three years, I did kind of an Aiken through her MTP fusion, um, used a plate this time. Um, and, you know, now she's a year out from that and she's finally happy with me. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Toulousen. Um, that was a broad array of, of applications there. You've, it's, it's, it's incredible, man. You're, you're busy. Um, thank you for sharing all that. Dr. San Giovanni. Great. Well, and those are great cases, Paul. I think with everything um, you said, uh, one of the things we all, I think, share is that you, you come out of your fellowship, you think you know a whole lot, but you end up learning a lot more those first two years or three years in practice. And then you shape your own style. And there's certainly more ways to skin a cat you know, and uh, so it's great to share these things with everyone because it's an evolution of learning, I think, for all of us. But uh, let's see if I can get this going. So these are just a few cases. Uh, 
there we go. All right, so these are a little different, um, uh, just a different use of um, uh, all suture uh, repair system that you know that we were using for plant our plate, but it can also be used for hallux varus, you know, as we've seen uh, in the past with some of these other um, uh, implants. That, uh, for this was a pa patient, a 58 year old that had hallux varus and second and third uh, metatarsal head metatarsalgia. And for this one, it's a, it was um, a combination, if I go back, of um, really correcting some, if you look at her one, two in a metatarsal angle, you could see that it's abnormal. And if you look at the first TMT joint, see she's got abnormality there. Um, I think she had some type of congenital abnormality she has on the other side as well. And it's basically a zero, one, two angle. And over time she's drifted over into varus and the second toe has followed her. So it's not a classic crossover toe at all. It's, it's essentially following the hallux. But for this one, what I found is, you know, in the past, I used another system. I used the like past, like a mini tie rope. But then I would find that if you didn't correct the bony deformity, then it would, it would tend to fail. So I, I started combining this with an osteotomy. And when, with a lot of these hallux varus cases, and it's it's a matter really of balancing the forces that go through those joints or go through that structure. So, um, in this case, I used the paratrooper. Right, um, we don't had I didn't have any type of metal button or oblong button that would sometimes be a little bit prominent along medial hallux. Um, so I did a closing essentially like a closing wedge shot proximal first osteotomy, use the peanut plate, and then use the, uh, the uh, uh, paratrooper system. And it worked really nicely. This was probably, I think, my first case using it. So I used it prior to even using it for the second, for a second MTP plantar plate issue. Um, it came out really, it came out very nice. This is uh, her interops. And you can see her post-op on the right. She had had the previous surgery on her left foot where we did some hammer tubes and a wild osteotomy and a plantar plate repair. You can even see like that was a few years prior to that. And I did a MISs of her second and third. Uh, can you guys still hear me? I just want to make sure that you guys are good. Yeah, you're this. good. All right, perfect. Okay. All right, so this is another case. This is a 61-year-old female that had had previous four-foot surgery. She had had uh, MIS DMMOs for her second, third, and fourth. A bit of hallux varus, um, uh, enough that she was starting to have, let's say, symptoms a lot. You know, usually with this degree of hallux varus, they're usually asymptomatic, but this patient was having symptoms along the medial aspect. You can see there's a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of rotational deformity going on as well. Uh, as you look at that, the uh, proximal phalanx and distal phalanx, you're not really seeing them as much on profile. Uh, the other issue was that her second MTP joint um, was rather uh, stiff and she had arthrofibrosis and it was um, essentially similar to, like, let's say, a floating toe, uh, but wasn't having as much in the way of plantar pain, but she just didn't have that contact with the ground. Um, so I wouldn't call that a plantar plate, but, you know, I found, you know, for, so with this one I ended up doing... Um, uh, paratrooper to correct her hallux varus and um, did a uh, did a a hammer tube for PIP joint and a Z essentially like uh, you know she had MIS of her uh, metatarsal so there was a lot of scar tissue around her extensors I ended up doing a catenolysis and then I finally just did an EDL lengthening and an uh, EDB tenotomy. Um, as, as you can see, I did a plasty as well for her skin, which is a, it's an, it's a, you know, a lot of these secondary surgeries, these second or third surgeries for four foot lesser toes, it's good to have in your armamentarium how to do a Z plasty. You know, you used to have this plastics guys do it, but then when you look at it a couple of times, you're like, I can do that. You know what I mean? So it's a matter of really kind of understanding this, but that's a nice trick to have for some of these um, 
contractures because when you end up closing the skin, you could do a great repair of the joint. You could do a, you know, you could do a joint release. You could do your plantar plate, and then you know if it, if they've had multiple surgeries, you end up you end up closing the skin. You can just tell that this thing is going to stay up. They're not going to get that plantar flexion, that passive plantar flexion uh, through her through the MTP joint. So it's just good to have. So this is showing, um, you know, as Rob was saying, suture management is uh, paramount. And so you can see here, I'm passing the suture lasses uh, uh, ahead of time and bringing this down. I'm not sure if this will work, but you can kind of see, kind of tightening it down here. So bring it into alignment, trying to get that stability that Paul was talking about. So kind of advance that um, to here. I end up doing sometimes I'll end up even like just taking out like a like a wedge. I'm not sure if you guys see that, almost like a wedge of capsule on the medial capsule. Uh, this is a preventive thing so it doesn't come back. Um, so it doesn't tighten back up. And kind of so that's just kind of just showing two other. Additional cases in the in the Z, I usually close it with silk uh, because that's the plastic side. So but anyway, um, these are just two other cases. Another indication of Halix bears. Um, this particular one, I didn't use a proximal closing wedge or a proximal osteotomy. It doesn't have to be closing wedge. It could also be like a, a reverse. I've done even like a reverse promo, okay, on some of these. Um, so oftentimes I combine these with an osteotomy, um, but. Uh, it's just another indication to use these for. But um, as Paul was saying, as other guys were saying, you got to look for when you when you have these four foot pathology, especially a second MTP. A lot of this is mechanical, um, and you have to think about essentially balancing forces. Essentially, there's it was at one point in time a normal joint, and it became abnormal because of either some type of repetitive eccentric force, right? Or a sudden uh, instance of a force, right? But a lot of times there's a chronic repetitive eccentric forces to a structure that eventually loses its capacity to withstand that force. So always, you have to always be thinking about like, this is a, probably a downstream problem. So look upstream and think about forces and how you're going to balance those forces. You can, you can gain stability, let's say intraoperatively, but oftentimes if you have not changed the biomechanical issue, why, why, that, why that force is being directed to that structure, then many times we've had great surgical technique and, um, uh, to have an outcome that ends up failing. So just uh, this is just words of wisdom from somebody who's been in practice for now over two decades. You begin thinking about these things uh, like forces, and it's just a matter of trying to figure out how am I going to change that microenvironment, and and it could be through either osteotomy, it could be through soft tissue combination of such. It could be like Rob was saying, fusing the first MTP joint. Because we're all, and, and you're offloading like eccentric stress that a structure itself cannot take. Okay, whether it's due to age or collagen, or uh, you know, just the the extracellular matrix has changed when we're we're older. Um, these types of things. Let's. This is all what we got to think about. Last thing I want to say is that I think with the second MTP problems, I think where we can end up making. Additional progress is on post-operative management. If we're having if we're having devices now that let's say we can better rely on um, implants and better rely on in terms of immediate stability and stability that we feel is going to stand up to the force, then um, then possibly we'll be able to move these a little bit earlier in a protected plane of motion, um, get them moving earlier. Um, while not, let's say, uh, jeopardy over there. I think that's, that's critical.
Uh, uh, finito. <laughs> Dr. San Giovanni, thank you so much. Um, incredible insight, and thanks for taking the time. I mean, 2 a.m., that's just crazy. You have some amount of energy that the rest of us do not share. Um, I got a glass of, little glass of lemon jello next to me. I would be the same way. Um, <laughs> in respect of everyone's time, I think I've kind of nailed it down to three main questions. You guys did such a good job that um, a lot of the questions that came through have already been answered. On the planner plate side, this is a, a question that our reps get a lot of uh, when it comes to direct dorsal approaches. Um, but when it comes to exposure of the joint, of the plantar plate, either, you know, Dr. Toulouse and Thompson, Sanji, really any of you guys that do these, um, what are kind of the tips and pearls to gain the exposure? What do you guys look at releasing? Um, anything in that regards? Maybe um, Dr. Thompson, I, I know you have some tips that we've went over together if you want to kick it off. Sure. Um, like one of the things I mentioned earlier is early on in the first few cases, especially don't be afraid to um, move the tendons out to not emise EDB, EDL lengthening if you need it. You know, it's all part of the soft tissue balancing anyway. Again, it's not just for exposure, but a lot of times that contraction will tell you what you need to do as well. Um, so um, certainly echoing what um, other presenters have said about the soft tissue balancing. Um, you know, I would say per maybe one out of every 10 is particularly challenging. You know, when you get enough um, experience doing them, you know, again, how to move certain things, but sometimes they're just tight joints you have to work through that's pretty challenging. So, you know, there's definitely going to be those challenging ones. Um, I think that making sure that you do the appropriate release. And again, you know, certainly with respect to other opinions, you know, I'm, I'm fine with releasing the plantar plate off that phalanx and the collaterals. Um, I don't think it has any um, negative indications. Um, for me, I think most of the issues are the distal plantar plate in terms of the people that I see, um, in terms of being able to try to address those, you know, attenuated and partial tears. So um, I like to get uh, more of the exposure and be able to see the flexor tendons as well. Soft tissue envelope, like Dr. San Giovanni was saying, if the soft tissues are contracted from some of that scarring as well. Um, and then having good uh, assistance in the OR, just making sure you know where to put retractors. So usually what I'll start off with is a baby homing retractor when I'm doing my um, wild osteotomy and making sure they don't over crank on it. Because if they do that, there's a dorsal translation and it makes it a lot tighter on your osteotomy cuts. Usually I'll have them bring it more vertical. Uh, just try to make sure there's not any kind of uh, force working against me. Uh, and then after that, usually I'll convert from the baby homans to using some sin retractors just with that vertical, um, uh, basically ledge or support, just try to let me limit um, people getting in my way as much as possible and then be able to move around the edge of the table. Um, I stand at the edge of the table. I move around a lot. So sometimes you just have to move your body uh, to be able to get into the position to do it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think... Um... You know, like uh, Mike Coughlin and Truett Cooper had a had a pretty good paper from probably six or seven years ago, um, and they looked. They basically just put a pin distractor in, measured how much the joint opened up uh, first by cutting the capsule and then cutting the collateral ligaments, and that gave them like an extra millimeter. Um, and then sticking a maglamry in gave them like an extra two millimeters, and then you cut the planter plate, you get another two millimeters. So like each sequential thing that you release you get more room. Um, and then if you go and do like a while, you can get like a, you know, I mean, you can see almost a centimeter in there. So that, but you know, with each step, I mean, I think you're kind of doing a little bit of destruction, you know, you, you're increasing rates of, you know, that you, you may be imbalancing your tissues, um, and stuff like that. So, I, I mean, I try to keep it to a minimum. Um, and I think, um, you know, the, the way I've kind of approached to the, the, the planter plate is, um, sort of work the technique to um, be able to work in as little space as possible, you know, rather than trying to open up more space. But um, so that's kind of been my approach to it. Um, but um, yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I think it's okay to release the planter plate off the family if you have to uh, and, you know, do what you got to do to get in there and pass your stitches. But um, I try to, I try to keep it to a minimum personally. You know, that's another one of the main benefits of the paratrooper system is those people who don't necessarily feel like they need to or want to release it off that plantar 
portion of the proximal phalanx or going uh, doing a dorsal osteotomy as well. You know, you can also take that and apply it to that plantar approach as well, uh, which will uh, certainly flesh out a little bit more in terms of development a little bit later and present that um, at a later date as well. Uh, but it gives you a lot more options. Like we said, it's, you know, versatility. You know, you can have five different surgeons with five different opinions, still be able to have great patient outcomes and just having different tips and tricks with what works well for what we've got. And then like, you know, um, Dr. Toulouse was saying, you know, trying to do it as little space as possible. So, you know, early on, like I was saying, you know, don't be afraid to do those um, tendon lengthenings as part of that balancing. But the more repetitions you get, the more comfortable you can um, become with working in those more tightly confined spaces and um, trying to hopefully inflict less of that collateral uh, trauma or the secondary damage. Uh, I changed collateral out of respect to collateral ligaments as well. Thanks, Dr. Thompson. Uh, Dr. Thorson, to bring it back to you, and thanks for staying on. You're a, you're a trooper. I know this is running long here. Um, so a couple here, I think you can probably address both of them at the same time. I think one that we you've already hit on, um, but they like to use the straight hammer tube. Um, and you like to leave the wire in the patient. Is this done to stabilize the MTP? Um, and if so, how long are you leaving that in? And then the second question, um, do you have any thoughts on addressing floating toe following fixation and what would your approach be to that? Um, I, I leave the pin in the base of proximal phalanx and everybody just because I got to see them in two weeks, get the stitches out just to, as an insurance policy, even just in case they inadvertently kick something, probably one in five, I'm sticking the pin across the MP joint to provide some stability there. And it just depends on what exactly I'm doing. If I'm sewing some ligaments up, I'll probably leave the pin across the MP joint for about four weeks. Um, <clears throat> it, with regard to the um, floating toe, that's a complication of the wild osteotomy, and there is no real good solution for that, I don't think. It's really not a complication of the, the hammer tube. The hammer tube just makes the PIP straight. The floating toe is a, a problem coming from the MP joint. I, I don't know if anybody else has any brilliant solutions for it, but you know, I'll try stretching them, I'll try taping them. If that doesn't work, then go in and do an MP release and probably do a flexor extensor transfer, but even that, it's <clears throat> it, it's never perfect. The patient's never happy. They never have really good grip strength in the tip of that toe. Even when you go in and mess around with them, at least in my experience, maybe the other guys have some experience with that, but that that's not because the hammer tube, that's because the uh, MP joint typically because of the, uh, you know, you've done a while. Yeah. So Dr. Caesar to, to kind of clean us up here and bring us on home, um, kind of a two-parter here uh, for you as well. So what is your experience uh, utilizing TinoTac to achieve correction um, with any kind of crossover toe uh, type applications? And is there any pearls to doing so? And what are your patients reporting postoperatively um, in regards to movement at the MPJ, swelling, cosmesis? Um, I think you hit on a couple of those. Yeah, well, I, I did uh, at least three or four crossovers. Uh, and I mean, they're never perfect, right? They're never uh, food models, uh, but they, 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 they look much better. I, I briefly show one of the cases with a quick picture that I showed there. Um, so one, one feeling that I have, uh, I usually say in the talk that I, I can't promise that because I don't have enough to promise that, but I, I do feel that you could asymmetrically pull the, uh, the, the lateral and the medial aspects of the, of the flexor tendon. So you can pull more the lateral the sleeps than the medial sleeves. And I, I do feel that you can kind of drive the toe a little bit, not as much as with uh, uh, Paul's reconstruction of the collateral ligament that he showed, but that came with a cost, in my opinion, that came with the cost of having to open the MTP that I have been trying to avoid. Uh, one comment that I have here, not from me, but uh, one of my mentors, Guyton, uh, when he does wires now, he already tells the patient that it's a two-stage procedure. He does the wire and he already scheduled the follow-up to remove the capsule dorsally, kind of to re resect the, uh, the, the, the scar tissue on the dorsal aspect, uh, ready for treating the, uh, the, the, the floating toe. So I think that the lesser MTP is nothing against all that was said here, just a preference. I, I think that MTP, the lesser MTPs hate surgery. Uh, uh, and, and if you can avoid to open the capsule, I think they, they like it. Uh, and so I haven't had 
since I changed to GMMOs, I haven't had a lot of floating doughs, uh, and I, I'm very, very happy with the uh, with the range of motion that I can keep with the Tina Tech. Um, but I do think there is a way to correct a little bit the the, the medial displacement of the crossover deformity uh, with the second toe. But that's something to be proven. I need more cases to be able to to draw any conclusions there. And if I just just to finalize, and if I'm if I really want to correct that, I use the the traditional uh, uh, pin and pin and scar, right? Like like uh, Paul mentioned. If I if I really if the patient, I always ask the patient, are you really bothered by the, the actual plane deviation? Because I think that's the most difficult one to correct. If they're not bothered, I try to correct the crossing uh, with the MTP, uh, the, the big toe procedure, whatever you're doing there, uh, and the Tina Tech plus the DMMO. Uh, but I don't go crazy in correcting the actual plane. If they say it does bother them, that they want the toe as straight as possible in the actual plane, then I probably would just pass the, the, the a wire, provisional wire through the MTP. Awesome, thank you. Well guys, this has been full of incredible insights and we all appreciate all the different perspectives um, and obviously all of your times. Uh, Dr. Toulouse, Thorson, Caesar, Thompson, Sanji, uh, especially out there in Italy, thank you guys so much. Um, everybody that was on the call, appreciate you guys for showing up. Everybody have a great rest of uh, your night. Thank See you. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Jim. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Ciao.